Welcome back into Burner, everyone, for the next episode in our Rise of Bread series. Today we will focus on a country which has had a massive influence on how bread came into the modern era. La Douce France. And a little bit of Germany and Austria. Later in this video we will explore how to make one of the most iconic types of bread in the world, in accordance with French law. However, we first turn to the period just before the French Revolution. More specifically, to a person, Marie Antoinette. Sure, whatever, I can work with this. The infamous queen is reported to have said, when she learned of the starvation and unrest due to a wheat shortage, let them eat cake, or in French, qu'ils mangeant de la brioche. Is it actually fair that the English language for brioche here is cake? If Marie Antoinette was referring to this sort of bread, when she said the infamous phrase, it might not have been as inflammatory. Especially since brioche back then did not contain the most expensive of its current day ingredients, the sugar. Therefore, this bread used less wheat for a higher caloric value. So not that silly, if you ignore the outrageous price of butter at the time. That being said, bread enriched with eggs and butter was quite common. At this point, even the English were putting butter and eggs into their manchets. As we know from the famous Lady Arundel manchets, we mentioned in the previous episode. Oh, they seem to be doing alright. So, let's make some 18th century French brioche. Before we get started though, research. First, we have to address something this channel always gets a bit bogged down in at this stage, the leavening. Don't worry, it's the last time, we're only a few decades away from the invention of industrial yeast. Sourdough was prevalent in southern Europe, whereas beer yeast was more commonly used to leaven breads in the north, as we explained in the previous episode. As you can see, France, and especially Paris, is a bit in the middle. This is beautifully illustrated in the contemporary work by court physicist Paul Jacques Malouin, called Description et Détail des Arts du Meunier, du Vermicellier et du Boulanger, avec une histoire abrégée de la boulangerie et un dictionnaire de César. They weren't doing snappy titles back then which we can freely translate to a description and details of the art of milling, pasta making and baking, with an abridged history of the bakeries and a dictionary of these arts. Maybe abridge the title next time. Sorry for getting a bit geeky here, but this is one of the most interesting sources we've ever encountered in our research for this series. Malouin talks about how to refresh starters, what property water needs for good baking. We genuinely believe that this work marks the start of the modern approach to bread making. If he was alive today, he'd probably have a very interesting YouTube channel. One that we would subscribe to. Wink wink, nudge nudge, mm-hmm. Interestingly for us, he spends a lot of chapters comparing Levin, i.e. sourdough starter, and levure, i.e. beer yeast. He explains how Levin was more common in France, but yeast was popular in nearby lands like Flanders. He very objectively lists the pros and cons of both leavening agents, mentions how sourdough creates a richer taste, but yeast provides a softer, denser crumb, and how one is better in summer while the other thrives in winter. He often recommends combining the two. Sadly, his contemporaries were less open-minded. In the 18th century, there was a veritable feud between yeast and sourdough bakers. The sourdough bakers accusing yeast of being bad for public health. At one point, the sourdough bakers even tried to get an injunction in the city of Paris to ban the use of yeast. However, the yeast bakers were able to prove that yeast was fine, since the English ate loads of yeasted bread. And they were perfectly healthy. The fans of sourdough responded to their loss in court in the most French way possible writing books, articles and pamphlets dedicated to explaining just how disgusting yeast really is. But let's go back to Marie Antoinette, who wasn't originally French. She was Austrian. In the German-speaking areas, people had Kugelhopfen, which straddled the barrier between bread and cake. We think these would probably have impressed the Queen more than the standard non-sugared French brioche of the time. So we went looking for a Kugelhopfen or Kugelhoff recipe from the 18th century that was fit for a Queen. And we found plenty of recipes, but all of them were non-sugared. And this just doesn't feel right for Marie Antoinette. In the end, we found one that was mildly sugared. 
from a handwritten recipe book from 1755 by Marie Riesen, held in the Frankish Open Air Museum in Bad Winsheim. A recipe was contained in an article featured on the museum's website. It's written by Dr. Megel Freund. Now this one ought to satisfy a queen. For those of you who still want to make the non-sugared French version, fret not, we've made a separate video where we make just that. It's in a bit of a different style. Link in the description. For our Kugelhopfen, on the other hand, we will need 550 grams of fine flour, 70 milliliters of high fat cream, 40 grams of raw cane sugar, five eggs from which we will use three egg yolks and two whole eggs, 70 grams of butter and 70 grams of lard. You can swap the lard for more butter, but it's 1755 and butter is expensive. Since we're making this for a queen, we're also perfuming this with rose water. As this is a German recipe, it uses beer yeast as a leavening. We will use our yeast starter. Go check out our previous video to see how to make one of these. However, you can use one of the alternatives. Dr. Megelfreund in the original article uses the fresh yeast plus beer technique. We will put the recipes using different leavening agents on our website. When you've gathered all your ingredients, and there's quite a few of them, make sure they are all at room temperature. Just like with the medieval recipes, this recipe starts with a pre-ferment. Add all the cane sugar to your cream and then add roughly 200 milliliters of your yeast starter. Then stir until everything is dissolved. Then add two or three spoonfuls from your flour. Stir this until you get a batter. Now cover and set aside. Now for the hard bit. While the pre-ferment is fermenting, take your lard and butter and start beating them with a wooden spoon. The original recipe tells us to stir this for 30 minutes, whereas Dr. Meg Lefreund in her modernized version tells us to use a stand mixer. This is such a heavy task that we hereby give all viewers full absolution on using modern machinery. Go for it. Not for you though, you have to set the example and experience the history. You get to use a stand mixer in the next episode, where we completely embrace modern bread. The point here is to get air incorporated in the fat. You're done when your fat looks like this and it's nice, soft and supple. Once this is done, we go from the hard bit to the sensitive part. Take the eggs, your two whole eggs plus three yolks. We're going to add this all in one by one. So add one egg or a big blob of egg white and stir until smooth again. Then add the next yolk and repeat until all yolks and egg white are incorporated. This is like making mayonnaise, but instead of adding fat to eggs, we're adding eggs to fat. Traditionally, this is done with a wooden spoon, but a whisk makes this a lot easier. Do remember to be careful. This will take about 10 to 20 minutes. We're aiming to eventually end up with a mass that looks like a very yellow and very slippery mayonnaise. Now add in the pre-ferment. This should look something like this by now. Mix it in and add the rose water. Stir everything smooth again and add the flour. If the dough is too dry, add a bit of water, beer or cream. If it's too runny, add some flour. We ended up having to add a tablespoon or two of flour. This is quite a fatty dough, so kneading it is pretty fun, which is a lovely reward after all those hardships. Once it's smooth, put it in a bowl and cover. Now leave it to rise until it gets nice and poofy. Our beer yeast starter managed the job in about one and a half hours. While we wait, we're going to grease up our mold. Turban molds are ancient. You can still buy the traditional ones today. Ours isn't exactly traditional though. It's a modern non-stick. This video was already over budget and we had to buy the wig. Make sure the mold is well greased up with a handful of butter. Better to use too much rather than too little. When your dough is nice and poofed up, give it a knockback. And then tear a hole in the middle like this. Put the dough in the now greased up mold. It should be roughly half full. Your mold might be bigger or smaller. Now, as per the original handwritten recipe, we're going to keep this in the oven. Yes, that's actually in there. Just goes to show there's nothing new about any of these tricks. After under one to two hours in the oven, the dough should now have risen to fully fill the mold. Peeping over the edge just a little bit. Preheat the oven to 160 degrees and put the mold in there for one hour. After one hour, it should come out looking like this. 
Get it out of the mold and now let it cool down for another hour at least. Once it's to room temperature, cut out a piece and enjoy your cake, bread, whatever, like Marie Antoinette and answer the question whether it was fair to translate brioche as cake. Not that it matters though, because as most people know these days, she never said that phrase. No, she never said anything of the sort, whether it was cake, brioche or whatever. The line was misattributed to her decades after her demise. As mentioned before, it sits right on the fence between bread and cake. It was eaten with both savoury and sweet toppings. Some recipes say this should be enjoyed with things like crab butter. We're simply opting for a rich jam. As we all know, the royal party of brioches and cakes didn't last. The Ancien Regime came to an end and the rule of kings and queens was replaced with the rule of law. And what better way to illustrate this than with a bread that is protected by law, that is also one of the most recognizable symbols of modern post-revolutionary France. La baguette. The law, which is still on the books and in force, does not actually have a recipe, but it does specify that the bread should only contain wheat flour, salt, water, sourdough and yeast. There are also sections on additives which don't apply to us here. We're going to use 500 grams of white flour. You can use wholemeal too if you want, the law just says it has to be wheat. We're adding 350 milliliters of water. The law here specifies it has to be drinking water. For us that just means tap water. But you be the judge of your own supply. Feel free to use it if it's safe to drink without boiling or filtering. Then we'll need 10 grams of salt, which the law specifies as sel de cuisine. Again, for Europeans, this is just plain kitchen salt. But if you're not in Europe, you might want to look for natural sea salt or kosher salt. As for the sourdough, we're adding 120 grams of our wholemeal rye starter. But you can use pure wheat starter too. The law explicitly states that the levain can be either wheat or rye or both. Lastly, we are using 3 to 4 grams of fresh yeast. You can serve this with active dry, but try to get your hands on fresh yeast. It is genuinely better. Before you start, please know that this will take two days. On day one, at noon, you want to refresh your starter, so it's at peak activity later in the afternoon. Once it's all bubbly, we're good to go for real. Add all but 30 or so milliliters of your water to the flour. Give it a good mix, but don't knead it yet. Now leave this for one hour. This is the auto lease. Once the dough is properly hydrated post auto lease, add your sourdough and stir it in. Once mixed, let it stand for another 30 minutes. This is a good moment to start dissolving your fresh yeast into the remainder of your water. After you've rested it, pour over the remaining water and start kneading. Knead for about 10 minutes. Halfway through the kneading, add the salt. After about 10 minutes of kneading, your dough should look nice and smooth. Now, we put the dough in a rectangular container. We're using this container because it has a nice flat bottom and a sealable lid. If you don't have one of these, you can use any tray with some cling film or a towel. Just make sure the dough can spread out a bit. Pop this in the fridge until the next morning. Good night. The following morning, get your dough out of the refrigerator. Now wait for it to get back to room temperature. Yes, we need the yeast to wake up. Uh, you can't give it coffee, no! It needs to get up to 18 degrees. We found that for us, on average, this takes just under two hours. Once warmed up, we can start working on this dough again. Make sure that at this stage, everything is always lightly dusted with flour. Cut the dough into three equal pieces of about 330 grams each. Here comes the first tricky step. We need to do a rough first pre-shape. Take a rectangular piece of dough and fold it in half. Then tuck in the sides and fully fold it over. You can also just roll them into balls, but we think the next step is easier when they are already vaguely baguette shaped. So don't worry too much about technique, just make sure they are tensioned. They are perfect when they have a little bit of bounce to them. 
just like this. Now let these rest for another 15 minutes, after which we'll do the final shaping. Now here comes the trickiest part. We're marking out 40 centimeters on our work surface. 40 centimeters is the width of the baking steel in our oven. You might have a different length. Pat down the dough gently and fold it halfway with your non-dominant hand. Then seal that spot with your dominant hand. Now move up about half a centimeter and do it again for the full length of the bread. Following that, fold it fully and repeat the same sealing action. And now roll this into the desired shape and length. Here's another one showing you the process fully. The key is to keep going. Don't hesitate. Now we're putting our baguettes to rest for another 45 minutes. We are using a couche, which is nothing more than a stiff piece of cloth. You can use any makeshift solution for this. Often a starchy tea towel will do the job just fine. Just make sure the dough is gently supported on the sides. While these are resting, we're going to preheat our oven to maximum. And we're going to put this tray underneath our baking steel to heat up along with the oven. This is for the ice cubes, which we will also be adding in. We're putting our baguettes onto the peel like this to make sure the pressure and tension stays evenly distributed. Score them with a razor. We prefer either three cuts or one big long cut. As soon as you've scored them, things need to move fast. Throw the ice cubes into the tray we showed you earlier and immediately pop the baguettes in after that. We leave them in the oven for about 22 minutes, but this depends on your oven and whether you have a steel or a stone. Experiment a bit, your sweet spot is probably somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. After 20 or so minutes, say bonjour to your freshly baked baguettes. Let them cool down for about 15 minutes. Our rule of thumb for when they are at their best is when they are still warm to the touch, but are cool enough to be held with a bare hand. And now for our human's favorite sandwich, jambon beurre. Fresh baguette, some fresh butter, ideally homemade, a minuscule sprinkling of salt, if the butter isn't already salted, and then a slice of Parisian jambon blanc. On a besoin de rien d'autre. À la prochaine. We hope you enjoy this foray into French bread. As always, thank you for watching, and we'd be ever so grateful if you could leave a like or a comment, as these things genuinely mean the world to us. We'll be back in two weeks for the final episode in our Rise of Bread series, which will take us to the present day and Japan. <laughs>